Well, glad to be saved, ain't it? <laughs> appreciate the Lord, appreciate the opportunity, appreciate what you guys did for us over there, and just uh, thankful, Lord. I, I've always tried to do what the Lord told me to do, and uh, I know many times, you know, uh, sometimes you don't un understand, I don't, I don't know about you, man, I don't, I'm always leery of these preachers that always know what they're doing all the time. Uh, so a lot of times I don't know what I'm doing. I remember when I first started preaching down in the village and we started the church and of course uh, we kind of run into something down there. We didn't know what we were doing and uh, I got detained several times and I remember the third time I was detained by the, the authorities. They told me, you can't preach this anymore over here. And I remember going back to the place where I was staying and I was talking to men earlier about it and I remember uh, they shut the lights off about six o'clock and the light, I, I was on the second floor, and I remember uh, over my bed there was a little box window above the bed, and I can remember the light show, shining in there, and, and over top of where I was staying, there was, a, there was an Orthodox calendar with an Orthodox church on it. And I couldn't see anything else in the room but that, that calendar. I remember uh, going home that night and, and uh, not, not really knowing what to do and everything, and I can just remember seeing that calendar, and I thought, Lord, how am I, what am I supposed to do? I'd never doubted my call, but I always kind of doubted the direction things were taken. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. But uh, I remember getting back to the room, and after the lights, uh, it come to that, that morning about 6 o'clock, uh, the lights started to shine in, and went over and took that, the calendar back down off that, uh, that, uh, the wall there, looked at it, and went downstairs to that, the, the guy who was staying with the pastor there, I couldn't speak any uh, Russian, and he couldn't speak any English. We're trying to talk to her, and finally a translator came. I explained to him, I said, hey, hey, man, is there a print shop around here we could print this up? He said, what do you want to print that for? I said, well, I'll tell you what I want to do is I want to put the Romans Road on the front of that, and I want to see how to go about printing it. So he said, yeah, there's a print shop right down the road. So I walked down the road, and, and sure enough, this guy comes out of this, this print shop. It's an old, uh, look like a Diddy press like the one we have in Moldova, and he he says, yeah, he says, I got one plate left. And he said, I happen to have a plate for that Orthodox church. He said, I said, well, what, what would it be to me put the Romans Road of Salvation on the front of that? He said, sure, we can do that. So we printed up 26,000 calendars with the Romans Road of Salvation. I went back to that village. I said, I'm not going to let the devil have this town. I'm going to go back and I'll start giving off those calendars. Well, unbeknown to me, I started meeting people who had been praying for 20 years that God would send a preacher their way. That's how the Lord kind of works that way. He kind of puts you in a direction where you run into things. But I remember being down in the village and we just started a church and had several people saved. And I remember a little girl in the church had gone missing. She was about uh, eight or ten years old and she'd been missing for quite a long time. Her mother was broken hearted. She'd gotten saved. Her dad that year, I first year I was there, we did 18 funerals of people that were just down of natural ailments. And I remember uh, her husband had died, he, had, he was electrocuted, just a broken woman. Her life was destroyed because of it. And then, and then one day her, her daughter went missing down there. And so we couldn't find her, we put her picture out all over the poles and everything. And I remember uh, her uh, just coming into church broken heart, we're trying to comfort. I, I saw a lot of people like that, broken people, never had really too much. And the fool never understands a hungry brother. And so... Uh, they got there, and um, she kept coming in. She's broken. Well, several months went by, and a year gone by, I couldn't find that little girl. And all of a sudden, she shows up one day, and through a series of baths and going to the doctor, mom took her to the doctor, and they found out there was two incisions made at the bottom of her, uh, right around her spine area, where they had uh, kidnapped that little girl, and they had removed kidneys. Well, about the same time all this is happening, we had a meeting on a Wednesday night, and I'd always get to the church early, and people were coming in like normal people, and one lady came through those doors, and she was dressed differently than all the people in the villages. She had a, a, a white, white blouse on, blue dress, and red shoes. And one of the ladies from the village was coming in with her, and I said, I met this really nice lady, and the lady had, had a bag, and Inside that bag, she had this beautiful cake. Well, back then in those days, people never ate sweets, man. I mean, we'd give the kids oranges during the Christmas time. That was a great blessing to some of those kids that never ate oranges before. And I remember when she came in the door, I thought to myself, I said, 
She walked right in and the Holy Ghost of God said, beware. I didn't know what it was all about and and that day, and when I hear that still small voice in my soul's heart, I pay a little bit more attention than I did in those days. But I'm telling you, it's about doing what God told you to do, whether anybody sees, sees it's right or not. And I remember coming in, and he said, uh, she's got a cake for all of us, and uh, we're going to be able to have a good time after church. It's going to be a good fellowship. Everybody was real excited. And I remember the Spirit of God telling me, take the cake, and throw it in the garbage. So one of the men came up and I told him, I said, you take the cake, you take it out in the back and you burn it. You burn the cake and then you come back in. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm positive. Well, I did it and everybody was real mad at me for doing it, but I knew it was God wanted to do it. It's almost like when you know you're supposed to be doing something and God wants you to do it, you know it's very it, it, it's it's powerful. You better you better listen to it. So, I uh, we did that, and another week went by, and one of the men from the church calls me. Said, "Brother Paul, you're never going to believe this." He says you sitting down. I said, "Yeah." On the front of that newspaper was that woman's picture. She was a member of the White Lightning Group in uh, in Ukraine. She was a witch. And I'm sure as much as I'm standing here, brother, she brought that cake to poison us all. She was the one that had, was responsible for kidnapping that little girl, and she was, she was busted for having a, she had a, a ring of being able to kidnap children and taking, uh, taking uh, internal organs from them. And I thought to myself, man, that was just something very big, but I'm thinking about that tonight as we're sitting here, how many of God's people have, have ignored the Spirit of God when He's talking to them in their soul? Well, tonight I don't want to do that. I want to do what God told me to do. Uh, if you would, please, take your Bibles tonight to Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. And verse number 19. Habakkuk 3, verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he'll make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. You know, uh, usually when the Bible's written here, like in a Psalms, uh, in Psalms it's written for specific cause and purpose or individual, but then it opens up the Psalms and it kind of tells you who it's being written to. But here uh, you see who Habakkuk's written to here. He's writing to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. You see, they had an orchestra, and that chief singer was an individual that was over that. He was the director of the song and the, the, the worship at that time. And it, if I was going to entitle this message, I would title this, uh, Have You Lost Your Song? Have You Lost Your Song? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, we're very grateful, Father, for the day that you've given us. And Lord, we're thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. I pray, Lord, you'd wash me from the, uh, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray tonight if there be a lost one in this room, Lord, that's never been saved by the grace of God, I pray tonight would be the night of salvation. Lord, if there be any wicked way in us or anything that would hinder your Holy Spirit from working, I pray, God, that you would do a, a mighty work tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would put me aside and you'd speak the wonderful words of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that, Father, uh, you would convict us of our sins, Lord, that uh, you would uh, cleanse us from any uncleanness that might be in our souls tonight. Lord, take the Word of God and do what you can with it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that... Uh, you would do a work that this world knows nothing about. 
Lord, I pray you'd bind Satan and the evil one, the strong man. You'd bind his hands so he wouldn't do any wicked way in this place. Thank you for the precious Bible that you've given us, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost of God would speak in a real way. Bless the Word of God tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. I think what this book's all about here in Habakkuk and I believe Habakkuk was the voice of God, brother. He was used in a day to cry out for revival. I guess one of the greatest things in this country never needs is a revival. We need an old-fashioned Holy Ghost for a revival. Habakkuk was a patriot, brother, that loved the Lord. He loved the Lord, he loved his country, and he loved the law of God. He did what was pleasing in the eyes of the Lord, and, but he didn't like the direction the country was going. Habakkuk was a voice from God, and I believe Habakkuk is a handbook of revival. But here he's talking to the chief musician, and what he's supposed to say in the beginning doesn't end up until the end of the book here. Look at Habakkuk chapter 3, please, and verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. Brother, I believe America needs revival. I believe Moldova needs revival. I believe every country in the world needs revival. And the last thing he says, he knows a lot of things were happening in his day and age. He says if we really want to get in trouble with, the, with God, we'll lose our song. I believe I meet a lot of Christians around the world and they, they seem good on the outside, but brother, they got a, some kind of war going on in the inside. And I believe a lot of people in this country and around the world, brother, has lost their song. I believe uh, he goes first to a singer, and he's trying to encourage this singer to keep singing. I, wa I want you to keep playing the song. I, I want you to keep worshiping God, because if you lose your song, brother, you've lost it all. Brother, I believe in a time of great trials, uh, there's trouble everywhere, and I seem like the problems are getting worse and worse, brother. Uh, they're more that, they're more, the more you pray, I don't know about you, the worse it gets. I think the greatest need of Moldova is prayer. I think the greatest need of, of, of uh, Jacksonville, Florida is prayer. I think the greatest need of the church today is prayer. I believe without God we'll never see revival. And I believe revival starts in your soul's heart. I believe it starts inside. I think uh, one of the greatest things that we need is prayer. And I think without God we can do nothing. And Brother Habakkuk says no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark the days get, uh, don't lose your song. Now there's only three chapters here, and in the first chapter we see in uh, chapter 1, go back to Habakkuk chapter 1, he tells you the theme in each chapter. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Now the first thing he talks about is a problem here. So he breaks down the problem in simplest terms so you can get it. And first of all he tells us it's my problem and the problem that we're all facing. And the first thing I want you to see here tonight is heaven's silence. Look at verse 2. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are, and there are that raise up strife and contention. I want you to notice what he says. He says, heaven is silence. He says, I'm crying and nothing is happening. I'm praying and nothing is happening. Heaven is silence. You ever get to praying and feel like your prayers are not getting answered? You ever feel like the more we pray, the worse shape our communities get? You ever more you pray, the worse thing our nation gets? And no matter how much you pray, and no matter how much we fast, and no matter how much we seek God, heaven is silent. I don't know about you, the greatest need we have in Moldova is prayer. Brother, when you get to verse 3, not only does it talk about heaven's silence, but I want you to see in verse 3, why dost thou show me iniquity? 
and cause me to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. The second thing I see, brother, that he tells us in verse 3, I want you to look, notice earth's sin. He said instead of answering, all that's happening is people are sinning more and more. Don't you see that in our day and age? The more you try to live for God, the more you read your Bible, the more you hear preaching, the more you try to live a godly life, the more sin abounds around you. Sin abounds, sin grows. The more I pray, the worse sin gets. You don't think it's getting worse, it's going to get worse. And that's what Habakkuk is telling us tonight. You know why it's getting worse? I believe the church has lost its song. I believe the reason not, well, I'm not talking about the song of our lips, I'm talking about the song that's in our soul. You know, the variance is found in Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived and wrote at the same time Habakkuk lived, and so they're living at both the same time. They're writing about the same thing. Habakkuk says it's getting worse, but he doesn't tell you how it's getting worse. Jeremiah tells us why it's getting worse. Look at Jeremiah chapter 5, and I'll tell you why it's getting worse. Everybody doing all right? All right, Jeremiah 5 and verse 31. Jeremiah 5 and verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? I want you to notice what the Bible says tonight. He says the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. You know what he's saying? He's saying they're ruling by money. The more money they have, the more power they have. The priest, the more they go the wrong way. Jeremiah sums it up this way. Notice what he says. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests bear rule by their means. And notice, and my people love to have it so. You know what he said? He said, sin has come into the church and people love it. Do you know that's the same thing happening today? He said, the prophets, I believe there's more prophets for profit. I think that's reason most of our churches and uh, the ministries around the world are going to pot because there's preachers working for money. They tell people what they want to hear because they want to rule by money and means and by authority. So we see earth's sin is getting worse, and so he points that out that sin is going to continue to abound. So not only do I see tonight heaven's silence, and not only do I see earth's sins, but it's gotten so bad that he starts talking about something else. Look over at Jeremiah 8. You're still holding your place in Habakkuk. Jeremiah chapter 8, and look at verse 12, please. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I want you to notice what he says there. He says they no longer blush because of sin. They sin and they're not even embarrassed about it. Don't you see that happening today? People are not even embarrassed about what they're doing. They just openly sin. They op openly masquerade with sin. So not only do I see heaven's silence and earth's sins, but I want you to see Satan's success. Go back to Habakkuk chapter 1, and you'll see Satan's success in verse 5. 1, 5. Behold ye among the heathen, regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you'll not believe, though it be told of you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. I want you to notice what God's telling us tonight. He says, for lo, I'll raise up the Chaldeans. You know who the Chaldeans were, don't you? They were the Babylonians. The Babylonians and the Chaldeans, brother, were the enemies of God. You know, what God, you know what God doesn't say? God doesn't say Satan raised them up. God said, I raised them up. I raised up the Chaldeans. 
Look what it says in verse 6 again. For lo, I'll raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. You know what God's saying to Habakkuk? I believe God's saying the same thing to Habakkuk that, brother, he's saying to us tonight. Satan is going to seem successful. It's kind of like what the preacher was talking about this morning. You know, you go to these churches and they got all these things going on. They got all this fluff and all this stuff for the kids. And all it is is just trying to get to their flesh. And it's trying to, it's not doing anything for their soul. Satan's going to be just like that. It's looking like he's going to win. And brother, the enemy's going to come in and he's going to take more and more of the land. They're going to conquer more and more of the land. Here you got the prophet saying, that can't be so. Lord, that can't be so. Why are you letting that happen, Lord? Well, the Lord's allowing a lot of things to happen. Maybe this pandemic and all this stuff going around in the whole world today, maybe it's just God allowing it to happen. I don't know. You see, by the time you get to the end of this chapter, he starts talking to God. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, look at verse 12. Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? Will shall not die? O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, O mighty God. Thou hast established them for correction. You know what Habakkuk's saying to God? They're the one who's supposed to get it, Lord. They're the one who's supposed to get the punishment, Lord. They're the one who's supposed to get all your judgment, Lord. This isn't really fair. Why are they succeeding? Why are they not failing? Why are we failing, Lord? You know what God's saying to them? What's going to happen is plain and simple. Since you will not bless it, your sin, and since you have these prophets that are prophesying falsely, and since you have these priests that are only in it for money, brother, I'm going to allow the enemy to come in, and I'm going to allow the enemy, you to be captured by the enemy, and the enemy will take you captive. And what the devil is doing, he's trying to hold churches captive. He's trying to hold families captive. He's trying to bound people up. I remember in Ohio, you know, when I was uh, growing up, we, we went to, in Canton, we had a, a big old circus that come to town every day. I was, it was made, my dad take me to circus, man, and there was big, these big old elephants sitting outside those circus tents and stuff, and I was always amazed at how those uh, elephants, man, could, couldn't break that little rope that was tied around their ankles. It just amazes me how, how that, that big, ferocious animal with so much strength, brother, he couldn't, he couldn't move that thing out of place. He would just stay in place. You know, I started to think about that. He'd have to stand there and rock and stuff like that, and they could, what, what would happen is, is they would tie that thing's uh, leg when it was small with a medical thing. They would tie that chain around its neck with a big old bar, and for, for when it was a younger, younger elephant, it, it could not even break it. It couldn't, it couldn't even break loose of it because it had it in his mind. He couldn't move it. So while he was young, he had that thing around his neck. And, and by the time that thing gets to an adult stage, brother, you know what happens? His leg, he won't even try to get loose. You know why? Because in his mind, it tells him that he was bound and that he couldn't go anywhere. You're just stuck. It goes back to when he was a child and he gets stuck in the pattern because in his mind, he thinks he can't break that. He's bound up. You know what the devil's doing to people right now? You know what he's got people bound? He's got them back to the things in life. He's got that big old iron band around that chain around your life. He's trying to keep you chained up, brother. And that's why when we get to a place where we start praising God and we start worshiping the Lord and we start getting close to the Lord and suddenly you're overwhelmed with a feeling of what you used to be. And you know what the devil will do? He'll remember. You remember where you used to be? You remember what you used to do. You remember those old sins and he'll start bringing those old sins up to you and you know what happens? You start to praise God and you know what happens? You start to listen to the word of God and all of a sudden Satan wants to keep you bound on that thing and he wants to keep you tied up in your mind. You know why? He wants to keep you captive. He wants to keep you on a chain just like he wants that, uh, that elephant. That's what the devil's doing. But you know what happens tonight? God wants to set you free. If you're here tonight and you've never been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, you need to be saved by the grace of God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Have you ever been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ? Has 
there been a real salvation experience? Has there ever been a time in your life where you got on your face before God and said, I'm a sinner and that I need to be born again by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time in your life where you've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ? If there's never been a time in your life, today is a day of salvation. Not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's today. Jesus said it. Today is a day of salvation. So not only do I see the problem, it was his burden. He was so burdened down. But go back to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. In verse 2, I love the scripture. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. I want you to notice what the Lord tells him. He tells him to write the vision. So Habakkuk 2 is about the vision. You say, well, Brother Paul, what's the vision? God says, I'm going to change your view. I'm going to change your perspective. You looked at the burden in chapter 1. But God says, you come up and look at the way I, well, I see things. You know what God's going to give Habakkuk? He's going to give something that every one of us needs. He's going to give us some wisdom. He says, I want you to come up where I'm looking at things, and I want you to start seeing things like I see them. You say, well, how do you see things like God sees them? Look at verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he'll say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Think about it. You know what you got to get there, brother? He stopped talking and he started listening. You know what our trouble in prayer is? As we talk too much. You know what the trouble with us in our Christian life? We just talk too much. When was the last time you got alone with God and you say, Lord, talk to me. I'm willing to listen. You know what the trouble with us in prayer some of the best prayers, brothers, when you don't have words to pray. That's the best kind of praying. You say, what are you talking about? I'm not talking about some charismatic Pentecostal stuff. I'm talking about you getting alone with God and God infusing in your heart what exactly the need of the hour. You say, is it possible for a Christian to know exactly what the will of the Lord is? You're absolutely right. You get it close enough to that Word of God and get it close enough to the Bible, you know what God will do? He'll start infusing in your mind the exact needs of people's lives. You can be out in the public eye. You can be out in a crowd somewhere and not even know what's going on. But you can know what the Lord wants. And God will direct you to a certain pot spot or a certain person that has a special need. It's called praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost is a, is a, is a, is a doctrine of the Bible. You say, you're looking at me real strange here. But I'm talking about you not, not, I'm not talking about a list here where you got a list of things you're supposed to be praying about. There'll be a time when you throw that list away and the Spirit of God will infuse in your mind the needs of the hour. And then you'll come in here and you'll hear Pastor Peacock preach and you'll say, where did he get that? Well, he got it the same way you got it. The Holy Spirit's talking to your heart because Holy Spirit's been dealing with his soul about exactly the need of the hour. You know what it's called? It's called Holy Ghost praying. It's when you get alone with God and you start to pray and the Spirit of God tells you the specific need of other people. It's you getting close to the book. And it's not so much you reading the Bible, it's letting the Bible read you. You know what we do? We get in the Bible and we read it for everybody else. But I wonder tonight, maybe you, what you need to do is get in your Bible and start reading it for, for you, for getting something from the Lord that God wants to teach you and God wants to deal with your heart about. I guarantee it, you get close enough to the book and get close enough to the Lord, He'll start revealing to you the needs of other people. Amen. It's called Holy Ghost praying. I've met a lot of people that are broken. I can remember being down in the village, brother, and people didn't have enough, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. They didn't have enough food for the next day. And when those kids would get to praying, they were really praying, God, meet our, meet our needs. Lord, we need bread. And they were really literally, that's all they had. They didn't have any crumbs. In the, they didn't have a whole full, cupboard full of food. Brother, they were praying for their next day to be met, the food on the table. I remember one lady, she died of cirrhosis of liver. And brother, her, her skin was just as gold as the sun. And I remember going in her house and she had such joy. She had just gotten saved and she had two kids in the house. They were both as skinny as could be, and you could see the bones out sticking out of their stomachs. They looked like one of those people that you'd see out in those, uh, uh, one of those villages in Africa where those kids are starving so bad, their, their bodies eat up with parasites, and that's why their, their, their bellies would swell. You saw that. And I remember that lady just being full of joy just because she was saved. 
And I remember that, that next week she had died. We had her funeral. And I remember sitting out in the middle of that village with this thatch roof and those little blue houses. She didn't have, she didn't have nothing. She's, she's dead in her, 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 her casket there. And I remember it started to pour down rain. I remember the hopelessness of their children trying to pull her body out of that, that casket. And I remember watching her little girl walk into the house and sit in the corner and she couldn't say anything. All she did was weep and cry out. But I believe the God of heaven heard her prayers because she wasn't praying with her lips. She was praying with her heart. Maybe that's the reason why we don't pray. We're praying with our lips and not praying with our heart. God will show you those things. He saw the burden and God told him to write the vision. And so he writes it down. And then he realizes his mistake and he repents and he says, Lord, I've been doing all the talking, now I need to start listening to you. And I'm going to wait and see what you want, Lord. Maybe you're going through something, situation in your family. Maybe you're a young man or young lady. You're not sure about what you're going to do. You don't know what your direction is. Why don't you just sit and hunker down and just get alone with God and start to pray and you don't have to have words. You just get up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm just here. Lord, I got the Bible open. Lord, teach me thy word and help me to unite my heart to fear your name. He said, I'm asking all the questions, Lord. I just want to listen. You know what he realized? I haven't given you the time, Lord. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a mama and you haven't been giving your time to the Lord. You're, giving, you're worried about your children, but you haven't been giving your time to the Lord. Maybe your father here, you're trying to figure out all the things in your life and you just need to get alone with God. You need to get alone in that quiet place, that secret place of the Most High and allow Him to get a hold of your soul's heart. But notice what happens when he starts to get a hold of God. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Verse 2, and the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. I want you to notice what he says here. The Bible says, it shall speak and not lie. You know what God's saying to us tonight, church? He says, God's saying from my view, you're looking everywhere else for me, but why don't you look at down from heaven from my view? It's your time, Habakkuk, to start listening to me. Listen from my view. I've given my word. I've given my vision, and I've written it down for you. Don't you know God has given it plain to us in the word of God? All you got to do is get alone with him and say, Lord, teach me. You know what he'll do? He'll, he'll give you a word and he'll give you a phrase and you'll read along. People say, well, how many pages of Bibles do you read? Sometimes I don't even read a chapter of the Bible in a day. Because, man, I'll stop on that thing and I'll feed off that thing and the Lord will infuse in my soul and he'll put something in my mind and heart and I'll meditate. I think one of the missing things in our churches today is old-fashioned meditating on the Word of God and letting the Holy Ghost work in your heart and getting fixed on that one word or that phrase or that thought that God's given you. And then you'll come in here and he'll preach something and he'll preach it from one left hand to the right hand, up and down, all around. And then all of a sudden, God will give you answers to your questions. That's how God works. He will do it. So not only does he give the reliability of Scripture, but I see he gives a resource to the saints. Look at uh, Habakkuk 2 again. Look at verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his face. I see the resource of the saints. You say, well, Brother Paul, what is it? The Lord says, I'm writing it down. All you have to do is by faith believe it. That's all God wants. God's not looking for a rocket scientist to train. He's not looking for somebody that's got intelligence. He's looking for somebody that wants him, that wants him more than anything else, that wants his wisdom and wants his direction. He wants to feed from God. I don't know about you. I want all that God's got for me. I want to eat this book. I, I want to get all I can get from God. Do you? Amen. Do you? God gives us the resource. So not only does he give the saints the resource they need, but look what happens in the appointed time. Look at Habakkuk 2 and verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters 
cover the sea. You know something else about that vision? You know what I see? The reign of the Savior here. There'll be a day when this world won't be filled with sin. There'll be a day when this world won't be filled with turmoil and chaos. One day this world will be filled with the glory of the Lord. And I thank God for that. But I want you to notice not only the, the resource of the, the saints and the reign of the Savior, but I see the response of the sinner. Look at verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. You know what the sinner will say in the last days when you meet the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ? I thought about it the other day. I think one of the wild, I think one of the, 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 the most scariest things in the word of God is a great white throne judgment. That's the last judgment of the unsaved dead. And don't you know we'll be in heaven? And I, I thought about it and thought about it. You know, one day we'll see our lost loved ones. We'll see that neighbor that we were, we sat in that we lived next to. We'll see the guy that we worked next with and that lady you were close by and you'll watch those people be cast in a lake of fire, which is a second death. And don't you know all tears are not wiped away until after the great, after the great white throne judgment. Think about standing before the Lord. When you stand before the, the Lord, you'll stand before the austere judge. It won't be the baby in the manger. It won't be the man on the cross. It'll be the austere judge of Luke chapter 19. You'll stand before a cruel judge and brother, you will say absolutely nothing when you meet a holy God. Think about it. The only glory we need to bring to our life is the glory of the Lord. Do you bring glory with the life that you're living? Do you bring glory for the thoughts that you have? Do you bring glory to His name in your life, in your family? We'll say nothing in that day. The problem, not only do I see the problem, the burden, then we see the vision, which is a perspective. But notice in Habakkuk 3, now he can pray. Go to Habakkuk chapter 3, and now we see that he can pray. And it's one of the strangest prayers in all the Word of God because it's a prayer of praise. Look at verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive tree shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, man, the fruit may not come. These people might not be saved. Hey, our churches might not be filled. But bless God, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to bless the God of heaven with my life and with my family. I will rejoice and I'll take the shackles off. Think about that, brother. I'll praise you, God, regardless of what circumstances it is. Don't miss it. He got back his song. He could pray again. I wonder, do you have that song in your soul? Are you as ex more excited for the things of God now than you were when you first got saved? I wonder how much of what's going on in our churches all around the world, I wonder how much of it could be someone hindering the work of the Holy Spirit working in churches. I wonder if it'd be our hearts that are stubborn and out of the way with the Lord and not listening to the Lord. I wonder if there's things in our life that nobody else sees. It's not the things from without a man that defile him. It's the things from within that defiles us. It's the things that are inside that God's trying to work out. The, the pride that's in our heart. Somebody said to me one time, Arrogant humility is the closest thing to satanic pride. People proud about their humility. I wonder if the work of God depended on you, would there be anything in your heart that would hinder the work of God going forward? Would there be any pride in your heart? Would there be any jealousy? Are you happy when somebody else gets recognized and you don't? Are you happy when somebody preaches a message that's better than what you could preach? Are you, are you happy when, when things go well for other Christians and maybe 
things go well for other believers and God touches somebody else and He doesn't necessarily put His, His work in hand on you, are you happy for other people? You know what? When things like that are in our churches, there's a hindrance to the work of the Lord. Because you know what? There's always those little things that get the best of us. You know what God's interested in? God's interested in us in getting little. I wonder how well you are at getting little with God. I'm talking about little. I'm talking about not the first seat, but the last seat. It's not how big you get in the Christian life, it's how little you become. I wonder if the work of the Lord is being hindered by our own self, getting little with God. I wonder how well are you at getting small. Jesus said it's not the big people that get the big things done for God, it's the people that think of themselves little in their own eyes. And I wonder if that might be the reason why that many of us are not like we're supposed to be and we're not walking with God like we're supposed to be because there's something inside that's hindering it all. And you know it, and the people close to you know it. I wonder, is that true about you? I remember about 10 years ago it was true about me. See, so what some of you don't understand is those pictures and everything that you saw this morning, the Lord was trying to work out something in me that was hindering the work of the Lord. And I'm not afraid about what you think of me tonight. I'm more interested in what He thinks about me. But the first church I started, after five years, I turned it to a national pastor that was before Kostya. And he told me one day, he said, I don't want you to come back here. And I thought, what is he trying to prove? I led all these people to the Lord. I led all these young people to the Lord and baptized all these people. And my wife, got on, my wife and I got on a bus that day, and we walked on that bus, and guess what? We were brokenhearted. We got back to Kishinev where we live, and I, was, I stayed in the room for about uh, almost eight days. And I didn't come out of that room, and I put that cover over my head, and I didn't want to see anybody. And my brother, Bronnie, had come see me every day. He said, you're going to quit? I said, I think I am. One night in prayer, he said, you can't quit, Paul. He says, you can't quit. He said, we can get through anything if you, if you just humble yourself. And that night, I was talking to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord said, I want you to go back down to that village, and I want you to tell those people that you were wrong. And would you forgive me? You see, I got to thinking I was better than everybody else because I, was, I thought I was something. And I thought I was looking down my spiritual nose at everybody thinking I was better than everybody else. And what I realized, I wasn't better than them. They were better than me. And I had to learn one thing. If I wasn't willing to humble myself, God would never use me again. And the Spirit of God says, you go down there and you tell them you're sorry and you repent in front of all those people and you tell them you repent of the pride that's in your own heart. I said, okay, Lord. The next day I got on a, on a, on a bus gone down there and I went to the service and I sat in the back and he asked if anybody had anything to say and I said, I have something to say. And he let me come forward and I said, I want to I say something. I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I'm sorry for what I thought about myself and others. And I'm asking you, church, to forgive me. And you know what God did? God did a miracle. Because God did a miracle in my life. And you know what happened after the service? People were getting saved. People were hugging each other. And all of that sin in my own heart and all the pride that was in my heart was gone. And I was free. And you know what happened? I got my song back. You know, I want you to know, if you're here today and you've lost your song, you can be in church. Brother, you can be hearing all the preaching. You can be singing all the songs. You can be doing all the right things. But inside, you know, for without a shadow of a doubt, you've lost your song. Tonight, God wants to give you your song back just like he did the prophet Habakkuk. And it's a blessed thing when that happens. Because you know when it happens? 
the joy of the Lord your strength. The peace of God uh, passes all understanding, comes over you, and brother, it's freedom. It's power with God. It's strength from the Holy One of Israel, brother. It's only God can give that. And I wonder tonight, have you lost your song? If you've lost your song as a Christian, or you don't have the joy of the Lord in your heart, or there's something in your life that's hindering the work of the Holy Spirit and the work in this meeting and the work in things in your life and family, get it right tonight. Don't end up at the judgment seat of Christ and meet the austere man and find out you laid it here on earth. Hey, I don't want to lay anything down. I want to lay it all down. I want to get there and I want to stand before God clean before my Savior. And if that's the case with you, repent and get right with God tonight. Let's stand for prayer. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you need to come to the old-fashioned altar tonight. We'll have an invitation. And before we uh, go any further on that invitation, we have somebody come and play the piano there. If you've lost your song, or there's something in your heart that's kind of getting in the way, I know what it's like. I've been there where you're gone. You can get it right if you'll do it. While somebody plays on that piano, if you, if you need to get saved by the grace of God, don't sit there thinking you're going to heaven when you've never been born again. Get saved by the grace of God before it's eternally too late. When you hear the music tonight, come and get born again and say, Lord, I'm lost. I'm undone. I repent of my pride. I want to get saved tonight, Lord. I want to get miraculously born from above. Is there anybody like that, brother? Play. If you're not saved, come. If there's something in your family that needs help, he's, he's able. He's our Savior. He loves us with all heavenly love. There's nobody that loves you like Jesus. There's nobody that cares for you like Jesus. There's nobody who'll take the brokenhearted and those that are suffering and those that are hurting. He wants to help us because He loves us. He cares for us. It's the grace of God. And if you've never experienced the grace of God tonight, please come. And say, Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. I need you once again like it used to be. I need you to come alive in my Bible like it used to be. I don't want to end up in, in eating old bread and stale bread. I don't want to be feeding off the ashes of yesterday's fire. I want to get something from God now. Would there be somebody tonight? Come, please.